for the country appreciate it and for those folks in Nottingham, England. We were reading a, a very nice uh, article about Prince Charles and his understanding of the spirit. And uh, of course we have people up in Canada and Alaska. So uh, good to have you with us. And we're studying the book of Matthew. And for those of you that are here, it's on page 25 in the New Testament. And if you remember last week, we, we started with a, a thing that's unfortunately totally misunderstood by so many of uh, religionists, spiritual teachers, evangelists, and that is something called the abomination of desolation. Jesus was asked when the end time will come. And of course, most religious teachers have said, well, you know, when this person sets himself up in the holy place, then the Jesus will come back again. Well, it's a total misreading of that. Jesus says, when you see the abomination of desolation standing in the holy, holy place, then will the end time come, all right? What's he talking about? Abomination is horror. Desolation is barrenness. When you finally come to the understanding of the horror that exists in your life because of the barrenness of the divine mind, then will come the end time. Then will be the end of your subjugation to illness. Then will be the end of your subjugation to poverty. Then will be the end of your subjugation to stress and guilt and fear and anger and all of the things that have hurt you and have hurt so many people during your lifetime and during the world. The abomination of desolation standing in the holy place means you haven't the slightest idea that there is a God within you. You haven't the slightest idea that the kingdom of God dwells at the right hemisphere of the brain. Once you understand that, and once you're able to see that horror within yourself, then you'll start to work through your meditations to raise the spirit of God, to take away that barrenness, to produce fruit within that right hemisphere, and then will the end of all of your sorrows and all of your struggles and all of your misunderstanding of life and its purpose come. All right? And Jesus begins to tell us in Matthew 24 the various things, speaking mystically and in symbolisms as to what must occur to each person as you begin to understand these things. And don't think that this desolation and the abomination of desolation just happens when you don't know anything about meditation. It happens to you if you've been meditating for 100 years. It happened to me last week because a dog died. All of a sudden, I realized and I felt that there was a desolation within me. There was a desolation within the spiritual part of my mind, and it was a horrible feeling. But thank God, understanding as I do Tuesday night, and I'll, I'll come in here, I'll hit the floor, I'll go home with, say, 50 or 60 people, and we'll raise ourselves up into nirvana. Thank God that I understand that. But there's so many that do not understand that within themselves, in the right hemisphere of the brain, is what is called the kingdom of God. No stranger than that, no further from you than that, on the authority of Jesus Christ who said, cast your net to the right side and you will find, on the authority of the Bible that said, the door to the holy place is at the right side of the building. If you'll direct your energy upwards to the upper room of your consciousness and allow those doors to swing open to the right side, you will find God. And it's no, it's no more difficult than that. It couldn't be any easier. Closer than your breath, and yet you've spent your whole life with religion looking out into the clouds for some god to come flying through the sky in a white horse. Okay, let's take a look then where we are. Page 25 in your little Bibles in the New Testament. Jesus is continuing in Matthew 24 telling us exactly what will come upon each one of us and the struggles that can come down upon each one of us. Matthew 24 and verse 19. Okay. Now, in other words, when this abomination of desolation stands in the holy place, what's it saying? Matthew 24, verse 19, And woe unto them that are with child, and to them that give suck in those days. Okay. It's a terrible thing. It's a terrible thing when you start to become impregnated with this new life. When you're called maybe a baby in this new walk. And you're just beginning to say, and you're trying to share this with somebody. And you tell somebody, oh, you know, you'll never know what I experienced. I went down to this church in Fork and River, down in the basement, you know, and it's beautiful down there. And we went into a meditation. And I felt, I really, for the first time in my life, I felt this, you know. Here you are, a child. You're nursing, you know. You just started to take this milk. Here you are. You've just been impregnated with this brand new life as Jesus Christ has authored it. And all of a sudden, somebody says, where'd you go? Don't go down there. It's a cult. They do all of these things down there. And all of a sudden, that little child that has just been born within you is killed. 
all of a sudden, you who have just been impregnated with this Spirit as Christ ordained it, have been wrenched away from this feeding place of the Spirit. And God, Jesus is saying, oh, for those who are young and who have just been impregnated, for those who are young and are just beginning to suck that milk from the higher realms of spirit, oh, how terrible it is when they suddenly are thrown back into the horror of the desolation of the holy place. Do you see what he said? Because if you want to look at it the way the religion looks at it, they're saying that God is going to send some plague or some horror down that's going to terrify pregnant women and nursing mothers. Do you believe that? Of course you don't. So learn to understand things spiritually. Learn to understand things mystically. You do not have a history book in your lap. If you want a history book, you go to the store, you go to the library. You don't have a novel by Tennessee Williams. You got a Bible. It's a spiritual book. It's a mystical book. It's a metaphysical book. It's written in symbolisms, numerology, and all the rest. How important it is then to encourage people, to show them the biblical proofs we have people that come down here. These are not Eastern people that come down the stairs. They don't come down here to hear me say, this is what happens. You've got to be able to open that book and show it to them. If Jesus Christ is the one who said, if your eye be single, your body will fill with light, show them that Jesus Christ said that. And let them take it to them and show them, yes, Jesus did say that. What does it mean to the single eye? That which is, you know, you can see the dot in the forehead of a Hindu. You can see it on the back of a $1 bill. It's the capstone of the building. You look at the back of a dollar bill, you'll see a pyramid, and the capstone is a single eye. It's the most important part, and the only building that has a capstone like that, of a, 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 you know, where the capstone is the cornerstone, is a pyramid. And a pyramid is nothing more than a design of the human brain. Pituitary gland, pineal gland, all of that set right smack within the pyramid in the same way that's set within your head. But you've got to be able to show people, carry them along. Look at Matthew 24, 20, page 25, where we are. But pray that your flight be not in the winter. You know what that means? Pray that your flight be not in the winter. You know what winter means in mysticism? Old age. Old age. I am so old and I have been so filled with these traditions. All I've got left is I'm sitting in a nursing home somewhere and they send a guy over once a week to sing Amazing Grace. I don't know anything. And yet I am feeling inside of myself this desolation of spirit. But what do I do? That's the hardest time of all. The older you get, the further away you ever get from the possibilities of finding this spiritual truth within you. And we have a couple here that come on in the evenings, Al and Claire Benson, 85 years old. He saw me on television. He said to his wife, you know, we better get down, we better get down here. Time's running out. <laughs> and they come here all the time. See? And he's, be, he, he's, just, he's learning everything all over again. And he's just, you know, he's just eternally young now. Tell why he's not here on Sunday morning. Because he's got a job. He works. <laughs> guy, got, he, guy went out and got a job. And you know why he got a job? This is the funniest thing. The guy's 85 years old. He says, how can I turn this down? He's got a 20-year retirement policy. <laughs> it's great. Huh? He cooks for old people. He says, I'm the oldest guy in the nursing home. He said, I'm cooking for them all or else they need that stuff. He's great. Just great. He gets in here and meditates, and he's into this. He just loves it. He doesn't miss anything that he can possibly not miss. It's great. And he kids with his wife. His wife is little Claire. You know? And, and she walks along and he'll look at her and he'll say, the days get longer and Claire gets shorter. He's <laughs> What's the other? He had a classic though. I was standing in the back one day after the church and I was telling people about the mystical meanings of the Last Supper. And he said, I heard you talking about the Last Supper. Claire catered that affair. <laughs> All these great people. But see, it's so hard because the old fears and the old traditions, and so Jesus is saying that when you have, you know, it's terrible for a person that is all alone, old, knows nothing, and yet they start to fear, feel this desolation within them. Very, very difficult to do anything about. I wish, you know what I would do? I go to these nursing, you go to these nursing homes and see this horror, you talk about horror. You know, God, thank you, know, 
I told you about flower this dog. You know how magnificently beautiful it is when this dog was in pain and suffering so much? And then when we put it on the table, I couldn't stay there, but Joan stayed with him. And Flower was so sick flesh, she just closed her eyes and laid on the table. And with her eyes closed, the doctor gave her a shot. She never opened her eyes. She just stopped. Do you know how beautiful that is? And yet you go into these places with these people, and it's just a horror. What they, you know what I'd like to do? I'd like to get one of these Bally's double-decker buses and go to these nursing homes and drag them all out and stick them in and give them $10 worth of nickels or something and turn them loose in the middle of the place and live, wake up. Yeah? We incarcerate people into these dungeons and say, you know, well, I don't know, she's, she's getting worse. Suddenly you get worse. It's like putting a dog in a cage. You can't treat people like this. There's got to be. And you say, oh, well, what else can we do? That's it. We have made such a cesspool out of this planet. We don't know what to do. what we do to the old. That's what we, you got the old people in these places. You got little babies in Africa with flies on their faces. And the animals in nature, what we've done. We've made it, we've destroyed it. And why have we destroyed it? Because we are operating with the left side and we know nothing of the right side. But now this is a new age. And I know that shakes them to hear that. Let them shake. Because it's not going to change. And as Uranus comes chugging closer and closer to Aquarius, and the beauty of all of this lifts itself, and the realization of people that, yes, we are not here to save ourselves. We are here to help others. And get away from the self-centered ideas of religion. I'm here to get saved. The heck with that. I don't really care about getting saved. I want to make an impact to help you to be happier and your children to be happier. It's my, that's good enough for me. And I know Joan feels the same way, and I know so many of you feel the same way now. That you didn't feel. We were sitting with some folks at the Chinese restaurant the other night. I mean, you, you talk about hurt. We lost the dog. Sure, that's as important to us as anything because this beautiful dog was our child as far as we were concerned. But here's a young Chinese couple in this Chinese restaurant. A couple months ago, a babysitter was baby bathing their seven-month-old baby in a bathtub, went to get a towel, and the baby drowned. I mean, you know, devastating things go on. And all of this, which is horror, can only be changed as as we begin to replace that which is the consciousness of the carnal mind with the consciousness of the divine mind. When the life force is strongest, that's really tough. It, look what he says here, Matthew 24, 20. Pray that your flight not be in winter, that's old age, and neither on the Sabbath day. You know what the Sabbath day is? Nobody knows. It's the seventh. Seventh. Sabbath means rest. God created the world in six days, rested on the seventh. You know what that means? There are six chakras that come from the base of your spine, and they work their way up, right up into the head. The seventh is the pineal gland of the brain. Okay? Do you know how devastating it is? And for me, I'm up here teaching this stuff. I know of the pineal gland. I know of the seventh within, and to all of a sudden become aware of a desolation within myself. That's the worst of all. That's what, the, that's, what, that's, what, that's what the Sabbath The Sabbath has nothing to do with the day of the week. The Sabbath means you work to overcome those six chakras, and then you come to the seventh chakra, which is the pineal gland of the brain, and that opens the right hemisphere of the brain. There is nothing religious about this. There is nothing supernatural about this. There is no hocus pocus about this. Absolutely nothing. It is totally a physical experience. It is totally a, uh, an electronic experience that happens within your body if you'll obey these people like Jesus Christ and Hare Krishna and Buddha who told us about this. What's the book? How many times have you ever heard of your name must be written in the book of life? What did I tell you? Within yourself, going up the back of your spine is the six chakras which culminate in that chakra which is the seventh which Open the right hemisphere of the brain. Got a Bible there? Go to the last book of the Bible. Go to Revelation chapter 5. Show it to the person sitting next to you. It's very important that you see it. Revelation chapter 5. Okay? Come on, everybody look at it, and then if the person next to you doesn't have a Bible, show it to them, because everybody should see this in writing. Page 229 in those little Bibles. We're going to take a look at what the book of life is. What's it say? And I saw in the... Right hand, okay, that's directing you to the right hemisphere of the brain. Of him that sat on the throne, the throne is the higher consciousness, a book written where? Within and on the? You're sitting on it. Sealed with how many? You got it. That's exactly what he's talking about, and that's exactly what the book of life is. 
the seven chakras which rise from the base of the spine to the pineal gland of the brain. And if you were here a few weeks ago and it's on tape, Dr. Wilson up in Washington, uh, state of Washington, they discovered that the pineal gland of the brain secretes a hormone called melatonin which destroys cancer cells. What more do you want? Physician, heal yourself. Sit on the floor, chant Om, and tell the rest of them, take a walk, I'm going up. It works. It works. But it's a very tough thing, as, it, as Jesus says in Matthew 24, 20, on the Sabbath day, when you have reached that point, when you know the power of the pineal gland, and in spite of this, and Joan had to try to counsel me, look what you're doing, you know better. You've got to meditate. You've got to say, Nam yoho, ringe kio. You've got to do these things. And I'm sitting with everything I could hear was about the dog. And my mind is starting to tell me what the dog was thinking. But it wasn't what the dog was thinking. It was what I was thinking. It was anything to rip me down and pull me down and make me miserable. Oh, I put the dog in the pound. The, the hospital, if I hadn't have done that, she'd have been home more. Maybe I scared her. And all of this stuff goes through your head. And you're crying. And you just want to smash everything in sight. And you just want to leave. You no, nothing. Nobody can talk to you. Nobody can do anything for you. And here I'm up here telling you what to do. And if you had seen me the last few days, You'd want no part of me because I wasn't not, and I was irrational by this. And so I even said to myself, I can't go back up. How am I going to go back up there and teach people this stuff? But as I said, then, and God spoke to me and said, hey, they have to understand you're learning just like they are. You're no different than they are. Yes. You have to get up because you're not allowed. I don't care. You No, you read it. Come on. No, it's from John. You read it. Where's John? Come on, John. John, you read it. But you got, you got people on television waiting all over for somebody to read this. Get up here. You can't stand there and read it. Okay. <laughs> this is John. Uh, this is from the uh, Metaphysical Bible Dictionary from Unity Village. Okay. And you're just talking about the Sabbath. And it quotes, The Sabbath of the Lord has nothing to do with any day of the week. God does not make days and weeks, nor has he darkened his clear concepts of truth by the time element. Time is an invention of the human. The Sabbath is a very certain, definite thing. It is a state of mind that man enters or acquires when he goes into the silence of his own soul, into the realm of spirit. There he finds true rest and peace. The seventh day means the seventh or perfect stage of one's spiritual unfoldment. That's the opening of the crown chakra and the pineal gland, the sixth. Thank you, John. Thank you very much. Okay. John's going to do a TV show. Isn't that great? Okay, so let's go on with this then, all right? So, so you see then what, God, what Jesus is saying. You know, it's bad enough for a person that may not know. But when you do know and still you can't do it, it's really tough. And that's when you really crash and things are really hard. So, and that, that's, those are the things that you're faced with. There are tremendous temptations for you to give up, to give in, to quit, really. And those are the wars that rage within. And that's why with this Bhagavad Gita, where, where Krishna comes to Arjuna, your divine personality, and says, look, you've got, you got, you got, you got an army on the right side, which is the divine army. You've got an army on the left side. And he says, now you've got to fight. See? Because religion has spent its whole time trying to get you to change, and you can't change. I can't change. Nobody can. You can't change. You might say, oh, I'm a new person in church, but when you get home and you close the door, you're not. The same old, <laughs> right? And it never changes. But what you what you don't you don't change. You kill it. You kill out that old spirit until finally it'll abandon you. Matthew twenty four twenty one. For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not seen since the beginning of the world to this time. No nor ever shall be. Always remember when you, when you read Jesus Christ. Always remember Mark four thirty four. He never taught but in a parable. Remember that. That Jesus always spoke symbolically. And don't be ever, ever, ever listen to these people who will tell you that God's going to send plagues or horrors or tribulation. There in the Bible, in the book of Revelation, says it's a seven-year tribulation. And they say that the way they teach it on television there's going to be seven years of hell and pestilence sent on the world by God. doesn't mean that. The number seven in mysticism means divine intervention. What it means is that during your tribulation, there will come divine intervention to lift you out of it. God never hurts anything but hurt. Okay? There should be great tribulation. And when you're trying to stay this course, and, and, and you know, your lower spirit is doing everything to pull you down, I've just, I know what it is. I've just gone through it. You know? And we all go through it, and it hurts you. And you feel I'm a failure. 
I'm teaching people this and I'm showing people this and here I am sitting here acting like a buffoon. But you know, Al said something, or somebody, I guess it was you the other night, said something that was good. It's different now because I recognize it. Before I never knew, you know, that I, would, that I had stepped outside of the garden. Now I know. You know. And it helps, I think, it'll help me and it'll help Joan a lot when we're dealing and trying to help others too. Because sometimes, you know, I did, my friends, believe me, I did it all. And this dog was gurgling and, and breathing and it couldn't breathe and all of the terrible things. And I would lay my hands on it in Jesus' name and claimed it. And I demanded it healed. I prayed to everybody. I prayed to Buddha, Krishna, Zarastra, Melchizedek, anybody. Heal this dog. Do anything. I lived. I tried to get the dog. The dog didn't even have any legs. It couldn't stand on one leg. And I had it on the back and I lifted it up and I said, please stand. Anything. I was gone. Completely gone. Trying to do anything. 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 It didn't work. So I said, maybe there is none of that. Maybe there is no. I said, is there, what the hell am I talking about up there? I said, is there really something or not? I mean, don't you even, for God's sake, you're such a big shot, you can make a world. Can't you make a dog get better? Can't you even make a little dog get better? What's the matter with you? Say, completely. Completely gone. But now this little thing <laughs> called <laughs> Daisy. And you know what? I'm ready to learn a whole new lesson. And you know what? I'll never know what's going to come of it for Joan and I because it didn't come out the way we planned it. Come out the way he, she, it planned it. <laughs> so we'll see how the chapters unfold. But it is, I'm not the only one that's felt that way. Go to page, uh, in the Old Testament, go to page 502, and the rest of you go to page 70, uh, excuse me, Psalm 77. Psalm 77. Okay. And what's it say? Page 502. I cried unto God with my voice, even unto God with my voice, and he gave no ear to me. That's exactly the way you feel, doesn't it? Isn't it the way you feel? Oh, I, come on. I, I, this is my data to cry in the last few days. But I know each one of you. Each one of you have a story. Each one of you have an adventure. Each one of you have cried. And each one of you have been hurt. And that's why we come to this new age with such expectation. Because we don't want it anymore. In the day of my trouble, I sought the Lord. My sore ran in the night and ceased not. My soul refused to be comforted. Did you read that? Did you see that? There is nothing even God can do. See, I was such that I was so bitter, I wouldn't even let anything comfort me. I didn't want anybody to comfort me. I didn't want any help. You know what I'm saying to you? I wouldn't allow any of it. My soul refused to be comforted. And I remembered God and was troubled. I complained and my spirit was overwhelmed. You hold my eyes waking. I'm so troubled I can't speak. I've considered the days of old, the years of ancient times. I call to remembrance my song in the night. I commune with my own heart. My spirit made digital in search. Will the Lord cast off forever? Will he be favorable no more? Is his mercy gone forever? Does his promise fail? Has he forgotten to be gracious? Has he in anger shut up his tender mercy? Selah. And I said, this is my infirmity, but I will remember the years of the right hand of the Most High. That's what brings you back to the holy place. Come on back to me, back with me where we were. Matthew 24, verse 22. And except those days be shortened, there should be no flesh saved. But for the elect, those days will be shortened. The days being mentioned here are the six days of creation, which are those six chakras. And as each nerve area is opened up, there's a collision with the flesh and a difficulty. And sometimes it is, it's just to the point where you can't, you can't feel you're going to overcome it, but the higher realms become stronger. And as the higher realms become stronger, the lower realms become weaker, and the days are shortened, and the struggle upward is shortened. And then soon you're caught up by his power, and Jesus, Jesus is saying, you know, what he's saying is you can't do it by yourself. You can't overcome it by yourself. 
And you can't do it by giving any church money. And you can't do it by reading the Bible. And you can't do it by saying any prayers. And you can't do it by going on any marches. You can't do it by coming to see any evangelists. The only way you can do it is by what Jesus said. Seek first the kingdom which is within you. Seek it by yourself. To thine own self be true. Physician, heal yourself. Seek within yourself for the glory and the kingdom which is one with God. And you become one with God. And God becomes one with you within yourself. It's the only way. So we become discouraged, and it's, it's good to know that there is this higher power which will strengthen and strengthen and pull us up quicker and quicker. And God knows I, I, I need it right now, a double dose. Matthew 24, 23. But if any man shall say unto you, Lo, here's the Christ, or there, believe it not, for there shall be arise false Christs and false prophets and show great signs and wonders that they shall deceive even the very elect. That doesn't necessarily mean just mainline religion. Oh, you know, they're all over. You can buy the magazines, go into the bookstores, everybody, how to find God, how to get your healing, how to get your prosperity. You know what I'm telling you? And you can stack these books up by the tons and you'll still be broke, you'll still be sick, and you'll still be confused. It's not just in religion that's that way. You can go in the New Age magazines, and they got tons of pages. Everybody's got the new scientific method, the special rocks, you know, the special incense, the special earphones that'll take you. Do not use these while you're driving a car because you will go into higher, and all this kind of stuff. Everybody's got a gimmick. And you know what these gimmicks are? They all cost money. Everybody is making a buck on your misery. Everybody. Doesn't make any difference. And, and it, you can go anywhere you go. If you can go over to the Holy Land, and in order to get in the shrine, it's going to cost you two and a half bucks. And then you can get a pennant. I visited the holy birthplace of Jesus, and you can get a jar of holy water for $16. Or you can go to the pyramids. You know, I saw the grave of the tomb of Isis, you know, and they took a picture with Muhammad, and that cost only $35. Doesn't make any difference. Doesn't make any difference. People are all kinds of religion, old age, new age, lined up to make a buck on spirituality. And it's a terrible thing. Matthew 24, verse 25. Behold, I have told you before. You ought to, you ought to, you ought to take that one and stick it on your refrigerator. That's 2,000 years ago. I told you this was going to happen. Jesus is saying, I told you this. You can look at Christian magazines. Everybody's got the right book or the right tape. You can look at the New Age magazines. Everybody has the right technique or the right crystal. And it all costs money. And Jesus Christ is saying, but look, this is 2,000 years. And I told you this before. I told you exactly what was going to happen. There's always somebody who's got his hand in your pocket ready to make a profit on your misery and my misery. And I had this the other night. I said that the one thing that I think is very strongly that a preacher should not take money. Should not take money. Should not be paid. Because of the fact that once a preacher that gives that gospel out is paid, he is now owned to the one who's given him the money to say things what he once said. Not to say things which were true, because after all, if I'm supported by a church and I have children and they've got to go to school, who's going to play the Blue Cross if I say the thing that's the truth? So I've got to continue to say what I have to say, you know? And then I'm continuing to mislead people, even though I may know different, but I can't take the chance of losing my social security, and I got this free house and all of this stuff. Get into a heck of a compromise. You talk about a conflict of interest. It's a tremendous conflict of interest. When you get out to tell the message, you've got to tell the message that even if people get up and walk out the door, so be it. They get up and walk out the door. And that used to hurt me. It used to hurt me terribly. But the point is now, okay, I don't have to change this because I'm going to lose money. I don't have to change this because I won't be able to pay my insurance. I've got a job so I can teach the truth without worrying about compromising it over money. Most of them can't do that. Matthew 24, 26. And Jesus says, if they shall say to you, behold, he's in the desert, don't go forth. Behold, he's in the secret chambers, believe it not. If anybody tells you you're going to find the Holy Spirit activated somewhere, don't go there. If anybody tells you that God is going to be in a particular place, don't go there. See? And that's what Jesus Christ is saying, because the only place that you can find God in this world is in yourself. 
You'll never find him anyplace else. No matter where you go, you can go into cathedrals. You can have stained glass. You can come in this room, but nowhere will you find God until you find that within yourself. And nowhere will you ever have faith or belief in God. You've got to know because you've got to become one. You and God have got to become one together. A oneness together that you know. And when that right side starts to open up, you know. And it's a long struggle. There's a lot of things to do. There's a lot of things to overcome. I mean, you know, you started, and most of you, you know, I don't know how many how years old you are, but all of the years that you've been filled with all of this crud which is pushed down on you, you got to do this, you got to do that, you can't do this, you can't do that, you got to be, I said, they take kids out of, I remember a guru, tell, I read one time, so you take a little kid down to the beach, what do you do? Oh, don't go near the water, you get your suit wet. Don't sit in the sand, you get it all over. You buy an ice cream, don't get it all over your face. He says, water's to get wet and sand's to get covered over. Ice cream's to get all over your face. And you want to break everybody of every beautiful thing so that they conform to be like we are. And what are we? Take a look at the world. Oh, the great America. Huh? I watched them on Christian television the other day. You know what they were doing in church? They had the Marines there. Fourth of July. From the halls of my... Zoom. You can't do that. Because if you're going to follow Jesus Christ, you can't clench a fist. If you're going to follow Jesus Christ, you can't pick up a gun. You can't kill a Saul. I don't care if it's a person in Iraq, if it's a person in Iran, or wherever they are. They are just as much God-centered as you'll ever be. They are just as much filled with Christ as any of us ever will be. You can't hurt one. You can't hurt an animal. You can't kill anything. You can't celebrate. You can't be patriotic of your victory of how many people you've killed and then come into the place and follow Jesus Christ. You can't do it. And that hurts. That doesn't make any friends for me. But you've got to tell you, gotta, which, what, what are you going to choose to do? Am I continue this? How many wars are you going to win? How many wars are you going to win until it's all over, until finally they push the big one? How many wars are you going to win? No, oh, it all depends. You know, your enemies several years ago, now they're your buddies, you know. Some years ago, the Russians, oh, they were the evil empire. Now you set up Wawa's and Burger Kings and 7-Elevens and all that stuff in downtown Moscow. So what's fashionable? It's all bull. It's all superstition. His dwelling place is in a secret place, all right. It's in you. Darkness is his secret place, it says in Psalm 1811. Just give me a couple more minutes and I'm out of here. Psalm 27.5 says, in the secret of his tabernacle. Psalm 91.1 says, He that dwells in the secret place of the Most High. Where is the secret place of God? Come on. Look, yeah, but don't, don't, just tell me. Look, open that book to page 77 in the New Testament. Luke 17, verse 21. Where is the secret place? Where is the kingdom of God? I'm not saying it. Pastor Huey's not saying it. Rabbi so-and-so's not saying it. The great guru's not saying it. Let's turn it to Jesus Christ. And if you'll take his word, and if religion will take his word, and if the cosmos will take his word, where does he say it is? Let's all read it together. Luke 17, verse 21. The kingdom of God is? Within. Where is it? Within. Within you. He didn't come to this earth to say how great he was. He came to this earth to say how great you are. You! And what do they tell you? We're all worthless sinners. Nuts to them. That may be their problem, but you're not a worthless sinner because Jesus Christ said, you know something, Christy? You are the light of the world. And once you believe it, hey, nobody can sit you down in your fanny. Nobody can sit you down because you are the light of the world. And once you believe it, that'll shine. That'll shine. That'll shine. Huh? You, you, you that are special. I just want to show you one thing real quick. Go to page uh, 117 in your Old Testament, the book of Numbers. I'll show you something real quick, and we're really almost done. Numbers chapter 3, okay? And let's go to verse 38. Now watch this, see? The kingdom of God is within you. Remember? Uh, uh, it's on the right side. It's, here's the way this was. Look at this. This is the way they camped. The tabernacle was here. On the north was uh, whoop, Dan. That was uh, the emotional nature. On the south was Rube, uh, Reuben, which is the physical nature. On the west was Ephraim, which is the intellectual nature. On the east, at the point of the rising sun, was Judah. Whenever you look north 
on that map, numbers 2-2, two, two, east is always on the right. The camp of Judah, the Jew is the one who camps at the right side. Okay, that's what a Jew really means. A Jew is not one outwardly, a Jew is one inwardly. Numbers 3, verse 38, watch this. But those that camp before the tabernacle to the there you go. Even before the tabernacle of the congregation, eastward, okay, eastward, shall be Moses and Aaron and his sons keeping the charge of the sanctuary for the children of Israel. And now the stranger is the thought. The stranger is the ugly thought that has been killing me the last couple of weeks. The stranger is the ugly thought that has been happening to you. And what does it say? And the stranger that comes nigh shall be put to death. You see it? You see it? That's exactly what it's talking about. That when you are camping at the east, when you are directing your energies to that right hemisphere, to that holy place, that stranger, that strange thought which can kill you will be put to death. That's the promise. So how do we know that? What is it then? How do we know the location of God? You don't follow any book. You don't follow any teacher. You gotta follow that impulse. Go back real quick to where we are. Just two more little verses and they're both in the same place. Matthew 24, we were at, okay? Now this is how it comes. You ready? With me? Huh? Here, what do we have over here? We have the spirit. Come on, look at, look at me from just a bit. Here's the spirit over here at the east. Judah, okay? Numbers two. Here's the intellect over here at the west. You see it every day. What is it that blocks out the sun in the east? That which is the west. The west encroaches on the east. There's no more light. You see it every day. Tonight when you see it, it will be the intellect that is encroaching on the spirit. Darkness comes about the earth. That's why the Bible put it this way. All right? Now, watch what it says here. This is where wisdom comes from. This is where understanding comes from. This is how you know. Watch this one. Matthew 24, okay, verse 27. Okay? Okay. For as the lightning comes out of the understanding, wisdom, understanding, wisdom, enlightenment, discernment, and shines to the intellect as that which comes from the right side quickly shines to the left side you all of a sudden say I understand I know I know I know as lightning which comes from the east from the Spirit of God within me from the right hemisphere of the brain boom, shoots to the left which is my carnal mind I know what to do I know how to do it you know what happened to us when we got that little dog lightning came from the east to the west because all of a sudden we were looking for the special dog that would fulfill everything that we dreamed and instead of that Jones said in there boom lightning came and a little mutt went bang there it is and before we even had time to think about it all of a sudden lightning came why huh? understanding wisdom spirit teaching comes from here to there okay that's the way it happens no other way so don't be fooled by salvation peddlers from the old age, and don't be fooled by technique peddlers from the new age. They're waiting. You know what they're doing? Listen to me. Watch. Huh? They're waiting and hovering. You've got problems, haven't you? They're hovering over you, waiting to grab you. <laughs> you got problems, Uncle Dave? They're waiting to just grab you. Now, I know you got problems. <laughs> Hovering over you. Now watch this, and this is why I said this to you. Because look it, there is nothing that is easier prey than a broken heart. There is nothing that is easier prey to get your money and everything else you've got than when your heart is broken. Sure, when your child is dying of cancer, you'll send the guy on TV a thousand dollars. You'll do anything. When your spirit is dead, you'll do anything. Watch this one, and we'll quit. I promise you, we we'll quit. Matthew 24, verse 28. For wheresoever the carcass is, that word should be vultures, there will the vultures be gathered together. That's Jesus Christ telling you that. When you're down, and you're hurt, and you're dying inside, you're just like a carcass laying out on the desert, burning, destroyed, dead and they'll come gathering around and with their religious beaks they'll pick your pocket dry. Thank you.